Please be seated. The court is now in session. Before I hand the floor to Noon Chi's defense and to Noon Chi to present their closing statements, Mr. Sao and Dan, could you report the attendance of the parties and individuals to today's proceeding? Dao and San. Mr. President, for today's proceeding, all parties are present. It should be noted that Nunchi is present in the holding cell downstairs pursuant to the decision of the trial chamber concerning his health. Thank you. President, thank you. The chamber would like now to give the floor to Nunchi's defense and to Nunchi himself to present their closing statements. In regard to case 002 01. Also, we would like to remind the defense and Nguyen Chi that the time allocation to your team, including both the counsel and the accused, uh, totals two days, two hearing days. And we would like to inquire from the council whether you, the council wish to make the presentation first or the accused would like to make their, his presentation first. Good morning, Mr. President. Good morning, Your Honors. Um, we, the council, will start uh, with our submissions these two days, and then our client will use uh, the part of the second uh, or that half day to uh, present his submissions. Good morning also uh, to the parties, to council, and everyone in the public gallery. Mr. President, your honors, Allow me to begin with a brief roadmap of the analysis we will present to the Chamber over the next two days. I will begin this morning by discussing questions of general importance to the fairness of this trial and the legitimacy of this tribunal. I will demonstrate for the Chamber that the procedures employed by this tribunal, including the manner in which the present case was conceived, investigated, and tried, failed manifestly to protect the fair trial standards which this tribunal was ostensibly created to uphold. I will establish that what has gone on in this courtroom has not been a trial at all in the sense that we, as lawyers, normally understand it. It has instead been a showcase of the conclusions that everyone involved wanted and expected from the day the tribunal was constituted. My colleague Son Arun will spend the second half of the morning and the beginning of the afternoon discussing our client's background and his role in democratic Kampuchea. Son Arun will first explain some essential facts about Nguyen Chia's background and his reasons for joining and ultimately leading the Communist Party of Kampuchea. He will show the chamber that Nguyen Chia's role as a senior leader of the Communist Party of Kampuchea was not nearly as broad as the co-prosecutors claim. Most importantly, Nguyen Chia had no role in the military and a very limited role in inter internal security. Nor did our client exercise any supervision over low lower level CPK cadres 
at the base. Instead, he interacted primarily with zone secretaries, who in turn exercised substantial discretion within their respective zones. In the last segment of today's session, I will return to the podium to discuss one of the two CPK policies at issue in this trial, the alleged execution of Lomnol soldiers and officials. And I will demonstrate for the Chamber that this policy never existed. And I will show in substantial detail that the co-prosecutor's treatment of the evidence in connection with this alleged policy is selective and seriously misleading. On the second day of our presentation, on Thursday, I will focus on each of the three crime sites at issue in this trial. Two portray the evacuation of Phnom Penh and the alleged phase two population movement. I will begin on Thursday morning by discussing Tupo Tre. And I will establish for the Chamber that the evidence surrounding the alleged events at Tupo Tre is limited, inconsistent, and confusing. And I will show that the co-prosecutors have failed to establish with any clarity what happened at Tu Po Tre in April 1975. And I will then show that the co-prosecutors have failed to prove that if anything did happen at Tu Po Tre, it was in any way attributable to our client. Instead, the evidence shows clearly that the events at Tu Po Tre could only have been directed by local cadres from the district or sector, or possibly by Northwest Zone Secretary Ru Nim. But in either case, is Nguyen Chia's role or criminal responsibility established? And in the second part of Thursday's morning's presentation, Sona Run will offer this chamber an analysis of the living conditions in Cambodia in April 1975. My Cambodian colleague will establish that food supplies and medical care in Phnom Penh were in crisis and on the verge of a full-fledged catastrophe. And he will establish, contrary to the co-prosecutor's claims, that this crisis began in 1972, long before the CPK to control of supply lines to Phnom Penh. And he will also establish that by April 1975, Cambodia's economy had been devastated by the war, especially the American bombing campaign. And he will show <clears throat> that prior to the CPK's victory in April 75, the United States government was already predicting widespread starvation in Cambodia, and especially in Phnom Penh in the years to come. And Mr. President, on Thursday afternoon, I will address the chamber for the last time to discuss the evacuation of Phnom Penh and the alleged phase two population movement. And I will establish that the policies set by the party center were framed in the most general terms and did not involve or contemplate the commission of criminal acts. And I will then establish that the implementation of those policies was the responsibility of lower level cadres acting under the supervision of zone secretaries. Any criminal acts that may have been committed were the consequence of that implementation. They were not intended or contemplated by our client, Nguyen Chiang. 
Mr. President, Your Honours, with this overview in hand, allow me to turn to the substance of this morning's discussion. And that is the fairness of this trial and the legitimacy of this very tribunal. Now, as the Chamber knows, and the public is aware, this has been a consistent and substantial focus of the Nuanchia defense from the day Nuanchia was arrested. And with good reason. The procedural irregularities excuse me, during both the judicial investigation and in this trial have been so persistent and so troubling that we have hardly had time to object to them all. So too, the effects of the government's pervasive control over these proceedings. And as we did in our written submissions, we intend to describe these failings here this morning. But before I do that, however, I would like to speak about some general themes. Of course, the procedural details are important, but there is a risk in focusing on those details that we miss the bigger picture. Now, the investigation, investigating judges in this chamber did not just make, in our views, a series of bad decisions. There is a common threat here. There is an underlying cause. And that underlying threat, Mr. President, is that no one at this court is interested in ascertaining the truth. This court was not established for the purpose of figuring out what happened in the democratic Kampuchea. This court was established for the opposite reason, because the people who founded it thought they already knew what happened. They thought they knew who was responsible. And so they created this court for the purpose of punishing those people. Those people whom they had already decided were guilty before this building in which we are standing here today even existed. Now even as I stand here and say these words, I can feel the reaction of the public gallery. And I can almost feel people in this courtroom saying to themselves, well, yes, but that's because they are guilty. How many are asking themselves right now, why should it matter if there were some problems with the process? At the end of the day, Nguyen Chia is guilty anyway. Now, there are two answers to this question. The first answer is a lawyer's answer. The answer is that in a court of law, procedural fairness always matters. There is a reason the ECCC exists. It exists because the international community, the United Nations, everyone knew that no fair trial was possible within the Cambodian judicial system. And the only reason we are standing here today is to follow <coughs> procedure, to allow the Cambodian government to proudly boast that our client was tried by a fair, independent, and impartial tribunal. And if we, if we cannot accomplish that, this whole exercise is pointless. We think that is reason enough. But there is also a second answer to that question. The second answer is that there are real and unresolved questions about Nguyen and Chia's responsibility for the crimes charged in this trial. Even after a three-year judicial investigation and two more years of trial proceedings, 
the real hard evidence of Nguyen Chia's knowledge and intent to commit crimes is astonishingly thin. The public perception that overwhelming evidence of Nguyen Chia's guilt exists is just not true. No matter how many times the international co-prosecutor calls the evidence overwhelming, the reality is that the co-prosecutors continue to rely on laughably unreliable evidence. Newspaper articles, foreign journalists, CPK publications that talk about communism and class theory, but never, never instruct anybody to commit any crimes. And instead of proving our client's guilt, this supposed evidence shows the absence of guilt. And Mr. President, we are of course going to establish this in much greater detail over the next two days, as we already have in our written submissions. But permit me to foreshadow one very concrete example. One of the most pervasive assumptions about democratic Kampuchea is that the CPK set out to systematically murder anyone associated with the Khmer Republic. Now, we are not sure exactly when this became accepted gospel. Probably began very early on when Francois Ponchot first published refugee accounts from the Northwest Zone describing these executions. Francois Ponchot has since testified before this tribunal and he acknowledged that his conclusions about CPK policy in those early writings were based on a small sample of evidence that turned out not to be representative of the country as a whole. Yet once that idea became embedded in the narrative of democratic Kampuchea, it became impossible to dislodge. It entered an echo chamber. It was picked up by one supposed expert, repeated by another, and then another, and then another. And eventually it came to a point that everyone knew that it happened. Everybody, everybody knew that there was no evidence to the contrary. Mr. President, Your Honours, I invite the Chamber to compare our submissions about the CPK's treatment of Republican soldiers and officials with those of the co-prosecutors. And I think the Chamber will find that our submissions are far more detailed and specific. It is our brief that looks at the witness statements, considers what they say, and asks what it is exactly that they prove. The co-prosecutors make sweeping claims based on vir virtually no evidence. They invoke vague CPK political theory that says nothing implicitly or explicitly about executions. They proffer not a single piece of direct evidence of our client's intent. Instead, as we will show later, they deliberately choose not to discuss the direct evidence of Nguyen Chia's intent. Presumably, they are reluctant to reveal what it actually says. Their argument does little more than recycle and perpetuate long-standing, baseless assumptions about what the CPK must have done what they must have done because we all know that the CPK did bad things. We all know that the CPK had a total disregard for human life. Now the co-prosecutors final trial brief and their closing submissions are dominated by this appro approach to prove. The actual evidence of our client's responsibility for actual crimes is so limited that the co-prosecutor's strategy is instead to persuade the chamber that the senior leaders of the CPK were monsters. They tell horrifying stories about the experiences of individual people 
without even claiming that those experiences reflected CPK policy. They use inflammatory, simplistic language to summarize and mischaracterize complex historical events. They quote selectively from CPK publications, failing to mention that those same publications specifically instruct cadres to treat new people, intellectuals, and the bourgeoisie well and with respect. The prosecution's selective use of evidence is perhaps most evident in their misleading treatment of Nguyen statements to Ted Sambat. On the one hand, the co-prosecutors repeatedly attack our client's credibility. They call him deceitful, dishonest, and accuse him of preposterous lies designed to mislead you. Yet, Mr. President, they routinely quote selectively from Ted Sambat's book and his films. They wade through Ted Sambat's large repository of new and cheer quotes, pick the small handful that sound inculpatory, and play them back for you ad nauseum. And then they call these, quote, highly damaging admissions, unquote, given not under pressure, which are highly reliable. Yet they omit to tell you that Nguyen Chia's statements to Ted Sambat, made in, made in private to a person he trusted, are consistently exculpatory. Now one example, one example of great significance to this trial concerns our client's statements in relation to the execution of lone old soldiers and the evacuation of Phnom Penh. We will talk about this later when we address these specific allegations. Very generally, the prosecution quotes Nguyen Chia's limited statement that he approved of the execution of the senior most leaders of the Khmer Republic, the so-called super traitors. Yet they admit that he simultaneously denied that a broader execution policy existed. Now, Mr. President, with your permission, let's now watch the full uh, five minutes of the video clip without selecting pieces of it. Please uh, confirm one point related to what I asked you earlier. That is in relation to the lunar soldiers. After the liberation on 17 April 1975, what were the policies toward the lunar soldiers? Or were there only policies to deal with a few top officers? Because after the liberations, the soldiers were executed. And what do you know about that, Nguyen Chia? As far as I know, the lines toward the defeated soldiers were first to surrender their weapon and Second, they were sent to their respective uh, homes or villages. That's what I recall, but in real practice, I could not know. Questions, what were the uh, policies toward those few selective peoples? Answer, they were to be smashed because they deserve their serious uh, penalties as they betray, betray the nation uh, through foreigners. 
questioned, but you inform later, that is after the April 17th, regarding the thousands of uh, soldiers in Pusa, the Badambo, Pailin, Bonte Minche. Do you know about those matters? Questions back then, I did not know about the solutions toward uh, those people. I did know nothing. I only heard about that after the reintegration. But during that time, I did not know anything. And if I had known back then, we would have to have uh, countermeasures against it. Because they did not commit anything wrong, they were a, an ordinary, ordinary soldiers and ordinary people. Question. Because a few days after the liberation, they were told to go and receive the, the prince, that is for those who had who held the ranks of a colonels upwards or the captain upwards. So even some civilians uh, wore military uniforms and then they were transported away. Nunchi, I did not know about that. It happened at the base, I presumed. Question. If it happened, how it happened? Answer. I believed it caused uh, by the revenge because the arrest or the killings were made secretly in the past, so it could happen as a result of uh, taking revenge against uh, certain people. I, I deny that it did not happen, but that's based on the facts that I did not know it happened. Regarding the lunar soldiers and Sarimata, what were the policies toward them? It was alleged that after the liberation, the uh, lunar soldiers were executed. Nunchi. I did not know where lunar soldiers were tracked away because it was not the role of the military to do so. At that time, they were demobilized to go to the cooperatives, that is the Lunol group and the remnants of the previous regime, because there was no food supply for them in the cities. Regarding what happened, it was difficult to understand, as the situation back then was chaotic. The, the spy war began at the time. So people were accusing one another. Your Honours, Mr. President, what was our client's incentive for lying about this? Or lying about it now? Yun Chi is 87 years old. He is close to death and knows he will die in prison. He concedes he was the deputy secretary of the Communist Party of Kampuchea. He concedes he agreed with and participated in the evacuation of Phnom Penh. He concedes that he agreed with the decision to execute the super traitors. He concedes that he knew of the decision to execute So Pim, his oldest and closest friend. Why would he concede all of those facts and deny knowing about Tupo Trey? And why would he concede his role in the first population movement but deny his role in the second? Mr. President, Your Honours, the prosecution also tries to confuse the public in this chamber by attaching simplistic and misleading titles to complex historical events. And no more is this strategy more clearly on display than in the co-prosecutor's fixation on their new favorite term about democratic compatia. <laughs> 
the so-called slave state. After six years of proceedings, the co-prosecutors now have the gall to say the common purpose of the CPK's senior leaders was to create a, and I quote, slave state. Now this term is completely useless as a means of understanding democratic Kampuchea and most especially the intent of CPK policy. Allow me to remind the Chamber that although the proceedings against our client have been ongoing for more than six years, the term slave state entered the lexicon of this trial less than six months ago, on 8 May 2013, during the testimony of Philip Short. Now, we did a search on the case file for the phrase slave state. The first time it appeared in any filing of any party was two days after Mr. Short's testimony on May the 10th. And Mr. Short, who invented this phrase, set foot in Cambodia for the first time in 1993. He began his research on the CPK in 1999. He speaks no Khmer, he reads no Khmer. Not a single writer observer, academic, or first-hand witness to the events in Democratic Kampuchea has ever employed this phrase. Yet the co-prosecutors now tell us that Philip Short's opinion is the best description available of the CPK's purpose. Not the, not the CPK's own political circulars, not Pol Pot's speeches, the uncorroborated opinion of a British journalist who appeared in Cambodia 20 years after the fact and who does not speak a word of the language. The co-prosecutor's recent epiphany that the common purpose of the CPK senior leaders was to create a so-called slave state as such, as such does not even pretend to be genuine. In the closing order issued in September 2010, the investigating judges alleged that, and I quote, the common purpose of the CPK leaders was to implement rapid socialist revolution through a great leap forward and to defend the party against internal and external en enemies by whatever means necessary, unquote. Even the co-prosecutors who argued in their submissions after the conclusions of the investigation that enslavement was one of the policies of Democratic Kampuchea, claimed that the overall intent of the joint criminal enterprise was, and I quote, to enforce a political revolution and destroy any political opposition to the CPK's rule, unquote. Now, obviously, we quarrel with the way these formulations describe the CPK's attitude towards so-called enemies. But at least these formulations acknowledge that the CPK had a purpose, that the CPK had political objectives, that they were fighting for something. In the co-prosecutor's final trial brief and the closing submissions, all of this becomes irrelevant. Objectives no longer matter, context no longer matters. The CPK is transformed from a political movement into a criminal one. It becomes an entity whose purpose was to enslave as such. Now this is a bad faith effort to distract from the question the Chamber should be asking itself. And that question is whether New Echea intended that the CPK socialist revolution, which was its true common purpose, would involve the commission of criminal acts. And the clear answer to that question is that it did not. Mr. President, the co-prosecutor's analysis, analysis of the reasons for the evacuation of Phnom Penh is equally incomprehensible. The co-prosecutors insist that the purpose of the evacuation was to punish the residents of Phnom Penh. And they claim to be surprised by our client's contention that the real purpose of the evacuation was to reform Cambodian economic policy. 
They ask, why should we believe this new explanation for the evacuation of Phnom Penh after six years of proceedings? Your Honours, we were flabbergasted by this question. Have we and the co-prosecutors been trying the same case in the same courtroom for the last two years? Our client was the deputy secretary of an entity called the Communist Party of Kampuchea. He was the second in command of a commu communist revolution. Communist movements restructure the modes and methods of economic production. They implement collectivist econo economic policy. That's why they exist. That's what they do. And even the closing order alleges that the purpose of the evacuation was to populate the CPK's collectivist cooperatives. Like the nonsensical slave state, the co-prosecutors feign surprise at Nguyen Chia's explanation for the evacuation of Phnom Penh is part of a consciously dishonest effort to delegitimize the CPK, to construct a fictitious, one-dimensional entity infused with criminal intent in place of the political movement which adopted and pursued lawful economic policies. Now, the importance of the so-called slave state to the prosecutors to the co-prosecutors' theory of democratic Kampuchea raises another question of critical importance. And that is the nature of the sources relied upon by the co-prosecutors. Now, we have remarked on and objected to this in the past. The pervasive use of secondary sources to support key factual allegations is a highly problematic feature of the proceedings before this chamber. Mr. President, an informal analysis of the evidence relied on by the national co-prosecutor last Thursday shows that in a single, single day submissions, the prosecution cited Philip Short's work 17 times. Like I said, a British journalist with no apparent expertise. And that's one every 17 minutes to this one source alone over the course of an entire day. And the co-prosecutor's reliance on secondary sources instead of genuine first-hand documentary and testimonial evidence is integral to their effort to simplify the story about democratic Kampuchea. Because secondary sources offer prepackaged conclusions and permit the court to uncritically adopt the analysis of a writer no better versed in the facts than the court itself. And these dangers are substantially heightened in this case by the Chamber's decision to systematically favor those so-called experts least sympathetic to the CPK. Elizabeth Becker and Philip Short, who were selected as experts, are journalists with no Khmer language skills, no academic credentials, and in Short's case, no exposure to Cambodia prior to 1999. Becker and Short wrote a combined two books and a selection of newspaper articles about Cambodia. By contrast, the chamber declined to call Michael Vickery, a professional academic, fluent in written and spoken Khmer, who had first arrived in Cambodia in 1961 and who authored countless academic publications about Cambodia and the Khmer Rouge. Vickery's shortcoming would seem to be, according to Francois Ponchot, that he is a communist. Garrett Porther and William Shawcross, other expert witnesses sought by the defense, whose opinions did not complement the the standard total view of the ECCC have similarly been rejected. Even worse than the frequency with which the co-prosecutors use these sources is the type of claims for which they are invoked. Another example, the co-prosecutors repeatedly cite Sidney Shanberg's testimony that the shelling of Phnom Penh was, quote, psychological warfare. 
And their final trial brief confidently asserts that Sidney Shanberg denies that the conditions of starvation in Phnom Penh justified the evacuation of Phnom Penh. Mr. President, this is ludicrous. Why should the Chamber care about Sidney Shanberg's opinion about the intentions of the Communist Party of Kampuchea? As the Chamber is aware, shortly after the evacuation, an article appeared in the New York Times by a man named William Goodfellow. Goodfellow argued that the evacuation was justified because of the food crisis in the city. Now, should we resolve this legal dispute through a debate among New York Times journalists? Elsewhere, the co-prosecutors claim that in the 1960s, Pol Pot was highly influenced by Chinese ultra-Maoists. Their proof? The conclusions of three foreign academics writing 30 and 40 years after the fact. As we have argued in the past, this is an outrageous approach to prove in a criminal trial. None of these writers could possibly have known what ideas influenced specific people at specific times. The reality, as our brief explains, is that Nguyen Chia was highly distrustful of the Gang of Four and that he rejects the Maoist label and was instead a conventional Marxist-Leninist. Mr. President, if this were the way to conduct a criminal trial, we could have saved a whole lot, a whole lot of money for the international taxpayer. We would not have had to have spend $200 million on judges and lawyers. Mr. Short's book is available on Amazon.com for $20.75. Seven candidates for prosecution by Steve Heather can be purchased for $16.5. We could have conducted this trial for about $41. Now, Mr. President, your honors, we presume, or at least we hope, there was a reason we did not do that. The co-prosecutors also try to construct a simplistic story about the history of the CPK. For instance, they repeatedly claim that the future leaders of Democratic Kampuchea, including Nguyen Chia, read publications by Stalin and Mao in their youth. Now, what possible relevance does that have to this trial? Are the, are the co prosecutors implying that because the CPK leaders read a book by Stalin in 1953, they acted like Stalin in 1975? Are they suggesting that the explanation for events in democratic Kampuchea lie not in 22 years of intervening events, but in Q. Sampan's college reading list? These vague and irrelevant claims about the CPK's historical background are especially appalling because of the facts the co-prosecutor choose at the same time, not to mention. The co-prosecutors continue the grand tradition at this tribunal of very, very nearly pretending that the American government did not drop two and a half million tons of bombs on Cambodian soil between 1965 and 1973. Now, we are going to talk about this in more detail later. But there are many reasons why this is of critical importance to this trial. But for now, I want to draw a contrast between the kind of background information that the co-prosecutors find relevant to CPK policy and the kind of information they apparently find irrelevant. Let's start by talking about the CPK's supposed policy against enemies. The co-prosecutors tell us that in 1953, New and Chia read books by Stalin about enemies. Then they tell us that the CPK developed a policy against enemies between 1960 and 1975. Yet they fail to mention that during these exact same years, those persistently identified as the CPK's primary enemy, the American imperialists, was in the process, were in the process of dropping more bombs on Cambodian soil 
than all of the bombs dropped by all of the Allies during World War II combined. Apparently, the co-prosecutors think that the senior leaders of the CPK were worried about American intentions, not so much because the Americans spent eight years of bombing them into oblivion, but because in 1953 they read a book. Mr. President, I would like this chamber to join me on a thought experiment. Imagine that the United Nations set up an international court to try former President George W. Bush for crimes committed in Iraq between 2003 and 2008. Imagine Bush was charged, was charged with the unlawful use of armed force, the deaths of tens of thousands of innocent civilians, and thousands of counts of illegal detention and torture. Imagine that the defendant, George Bush, was then told that the events of September 11, 2001, were irrelevant because they happened 18 months before the beginning of the temporal jurisdiction of the court. Now, would that make sense to anybody? Would it make sense if neither the indictment nor the prosecution's closing submissions made more than passing reference to September 11th? Would it be fair if defendant George Bush did not get a chance to explain the effect of September 11th on his attentions? to persuade the court that his policies were lawful and reasonable in light of the existential threats faced by his country? Mr. President, Your Honor, the American bombing is also deeply intertwined with the CPK's alleged policy of creating agricultural cooperatives. According to the co-prosecutors, the point of both the evacuation of Phnom Penh and the creation of cooperatives was to enslave to enslave the population. Here we are back at this word slave. The co-prosecutors co seem to think that if they say the word slave enough times, it will become the purpose of CPK policy. But the co-prosecutors make no mention of the fact that the overwhelming majority of people evacuated from Phnom Penh were farmers from the countryside who wanted to return to their farms. They make no mention of the fact that Cambodia was facing an economic catastrophe due to the widespread destruction of its rice paddies and the rest of its economic infrastructure by the U.S. bombing. The absurdity is almost impossible to fathom. How is it possible to evaluate the nature and purpose of CPK policy with regard to agricultural cooperatives without considering the state of the country's agricultural production. How dare the prosecution think that they can reduce the formation of cooperatives into a single word, let alone a word as simplistic as enslavement, without even acknowledging, acknowledging the primary force that made those cooperatives necessary? Mr. President, Your Honours, all this pales in comparison with the most blatant simplification in the story presented by the prosecution. The prosecution's attempt to portray the Democratic Kampuchea government as a strictly hierarchical, top-down organization with cadres in all zones loyal to the party center. With Nguyen Chia and Pol Pot at the top of a highly structured pyramid. The co-prosecutors willingly ignore the fact that they, that likely from even before April 75, there were at least two equally powerful factions within the CPK. Sao Pim and Ros Nin led a movement opposing the party center, a movement which was actively seeking to sabotage CPK policies from the moment the evacuation from the cities was complete. The full extent of the treason of these standing committee members, Sao Pim, Ros Nim, Von Vet, and Koi Tun, backed by the Vietnamese and supported by the first 
second and third ranking members of the present Cambodian government did not become known until 1977 or 1978. But it began long before that. Rather than trying to establish what really happened in democratic Kampuchea, the co-prosecutor simply accused Pol Pot and Nguyen Chia of paranoia, of being obsessed with enemies and conspiracy theories. Yet there is no serious question that Northwest Zone Secretary Ru Nim was an extremely harsh and cruel zone leader, that he had no respect for the lives of ordinary citizens and that his conduct seriously de deviated from Pol Pot and Nguyen Chia's intentions. Nor is there, for instance, any serious question that Pol Pot was truly afraid of Sao Pim. He was even afraid to enter the East Zone to visit Sao Pim. Nguyen Chia emphasizes that men like Sao Pim and Runim were not merely autonomous warlords. The co-prosecutors grossly simplified Nguyen Chia's position last week. The word warlord appeared only one time in our brief. It was not Nguyen Chia's description, but the description used by both witnesses and experts who appeared before this chamber and whose appearances uh, was sought, I might add, by the co-prosecutors. It certainly is true that zone leaders acted autonomously and with wide discretion. But that is not the most important fact about Rosnim and Sao Pim. The most important fact about Rosnim and Sao Pim is that they were leading and founding members of the CPK and yet actively opposed to Pol Pot and Nguyen Chia, first secretly and later openly. The most important fact about Rosnim and Sao Pim is that the CPK was not, at its core, a unified entity. The internal disputes which ultimately destroyed the CPK were not the consequence of Pol Pot's paranoia. Instead, Pol Pot's supposed paranoia was a direct reaction to a real and ongoing struggle for control within the party. Vietnamese hegemony and ultimately the direct involvement of the Vietnamese government was a critical component of that struggle. The simplicity of the co-prosecutor's narrative about the structure of democratic Kampuchea is equally apparent in its use of the phrase democratic centralism. The, pro the prosecution refers to this language repeatedly in its effort to include Nguyen Chia and especially Q Sampan under the umbrella of every single decision made by the standing committee. But their treatment of the phrase demonstrates no genuine re reflection about what it meant in a government populated by actual human beings rather than a sentence on paper in the CPK statute. The co-prosecutors seem to believe that there was a direct link between decisions made in the ivory tower of the standing committee and the conduct of every cadre, cadre everywhere in democratic Kampuchea. Now that might be true in a highly functioning modern system with sophisticated administrative structures such as Australia, France, New Zealand but it was not true in a new revolutionary state, still less one marked by such deep factional divides as democratic Kampuchea. Agreement to an abstract policy in accordance with an abstract principle like democratic centralism often had little connection to the conduct of the people within the hierarchy. The co-prosecutor's treatment of democratic centralism runs, turns from fantastical to dishonest when they claim, on the one hand, that all members of the standing committee were equal participants in every decision, yet that our client routinely issued, and I quote, orders and instructions, unquote, to zone leaders like Sao Pim and Rosnin, who, like I said, were not mere low-ranking zone leaders but fellow members, fellow founding members of the Standing Committee. The co-prosecutors cannot have it both ways. They cannot equate 
Nguyen-Chi and Q Sampan with Pol Pot on the basis of democratic centralism, yet insist that Rosnim and Sao Pim dutifully followed their orders. This myth of the rigidly hierarchical CPK is deeply inconsistent with the co-prosecutor's assertion that no real governmental structures existed in democratic Kampuchea. They say there were no real ministries, no real legislature, no real mechanisms of government. Yet it is precisely those mechanisms of government which are responsible for ensuring the consistent implementation of legislative instructions in a typical Western state. In democratic Kampuchea, outcomes were not dictated by structure. They were not dictated by the CPK statute. They were dictated by the balance of power within the party. The co-prosecutors will have this chamber believe that it was Pol Pot and Nguyen Chia who held the real and compelling power in democratic Kampuchea. Yet, there is no real evidence to support that. As we pointed out in our brief, there is only one clear hard fact. All of Pol Pot's supposed paranoia came to pass. It came to pass in exactly the way he feared that it might. Nguyen Chia was, it seems, right to have warned his fellow members of the Standing Committee in March 1976 to, and I quote, be vigilant for another thing with people who flee to Vietnam and who do not return and make propaganda leading others to revolt, unquote. Mr. President, Your Honors, as we argued in our brief, the clearest evidence that Democratic Kampuchea was divided in competing factions is in the fact that conflict, verging on outright warfare, was ongoing between the zones for almost the entire period of democratic Kampuchea. Sao Pim was purged, Ros Nim was purged, Vorn Vet was purged, Khoi Thun was purged. Why was that necessary if Pol Pot and Nguyen Chia were able to effortlessly exercise control over an obedient government apparatus. Mr. President, in all of these ways, the co-prosecutor's closing submissions continue this tribunal's tradition of telling a simplistic, naive, biased, and occasionally absurd story about democratic Kampuchea. Yet in some ways, these failures are not even the worst of it. These failures might, at least in part, originate in ignorance and misguided justice. But there's, of course, also something more insidious at work. The conscious effort by the stakeholders of this tribunal to deflect blame away from anyone who might share responsibility for the suffering of the Cambodian people and on to the two remaining accused seated before the chamber. There are many targets whose culpability has never adequately been considered at this tribunal. These include the Americans, Prince Sihanouk, Lon Nol, the French. But it is clear that in terms of direct, direct relevance to these proceedings, one rises above the rest. And that target is, of course, the senior leaders of the Cambodian People's Party who continue not only to steal elections, land, and natural resources from the Cambodian people, but also to obfuscate their direct and active role in the events for which Nguyen Chia presently stands charged. If democratic Kampuchea was a giant criminal enterprise whose fundamental purpose was to enslave the Cambodian people, then each of the three leading members of the current government bears responsibility for furthering that purpose. Prime Minister Hun Sen, Senate Chairman Chia Sim, and President of the National Assembly Heng Samrin all took active roles in carrying out the policies which the co-prosecutors say today were criminal as such. <laughs> 
there's hardly any doubt of a simple reality. However easily these men are able to shield themselves from criminal prosecution, their liability rises and falls with our client. If Nguyen Chia is guilty, so too are they. If Nguyen Chia enslaved the Cambodian population, then these three men, whose faces hang everywhere on posters in Phnom Penh, were his loyal executioners. Special mention must be made of Heng Sam Rin, whose role in carrying out the evacuation of Phnom Penh is of unique significance. As we have repeatedly emphasized, he is the most senior most military officer still living today to have participated in the evacuation of Phnom Penh. He was the deputy commander of one of the three divisions which comprised the East Zone Army. In simple terms, he was among the two dozen most senior Khmer Rouge cadres responsible for its implementation. He arrived at Independence Monument for that purpose at 9 a.m. on 17 April 1975. Like the American bombings, the various bodies to have adjudicated over these proceedings have continually found even more impressive ways to conclude that these facts are somehow irrelevant. But that should not and does not fool anyone. The direct complicity of the senior leaders of the current government in the crimes charged here today is of great significance to Nguyen Chia's alleged criminality. As we have argued for years, the criminal responsibility of the senior leaders of the CPK is sharply diminished by the autonomous and discretionary conduct of lower level members of the party. Heng Samrin's criminal responsibility, along with that of Chia Sim and Prime Minister Hun Sen, and potentially hundreds of other members of the current government, is inversely related to Nguyen Chia's. As the responsibility of one increases, the responsibility of the other is diminished. And it is for these reasons that the government's influence over the present proceedings, which no fair-minded person could deny, is critically relevant. The very individuals who have the most to gain from perpetuating this tribunal's convenient and simplistic narrative that criminal responsibility lies primarily with the leaders of the party are the exact same individuals who have proven their ability to directly impact the nature of the evidence placed before this tribunal. The government in this country does not even keep this a secret. The Prime Minister is openly opposed to this tribunal investigating the criminal responsibility of anyone other than the defendants in case 002. He vows that no such investigations will ever go forward. How can this tribunal expect to assess our client's criminal liability under these circumstances? How could this tribunal ever be confident that he, it has an accurate understanding of the responsibility of cadres who supposedly reported to Nguyen Chia? How could this chamber possibly conclude that the criminal conduct of cadres lower than Nguyen Chia was consistent with and not contrary to his intentions. Mr. President, these are the general themes that need to be spoken aloud about this trial. These are the reasons why these proceedings have so consistently failed to examine our client's responsibility or his defenses, his defenses in any substantive way. But as our written missions show, this is only the big picture. The failings of these proceedings are numerous and manifest and can be described in great, great detail. They were pervasive in the judicial investigation and they continued during these trial proceedings. Let me begin with a few words about the investigation. The fundamental problem with the investigation in case 002 was that it was not focused on ascertaining the truth, but on gathering inculpatory evidence. The co-investigating judges were not in substance and reality, impartial adjudicators, but auxiliary prosecutors. 
The investigation was driven by procedures prejudiced against the accused, and its sole objective was to produce a product, product capable of supporting a guilty verdict. One need look no further than former OCIJ investigator Wayne Baston's allegation that international co-investigating judge Marcelo Monde instructed his staff in 2008 that they ought to search only for inculpatory evidence to understand how seriously flawed that process was. Now, of course, Judge Lamonde denies having made this remark or claims that if he did say it, he could only have been speaking in jest. But ultimately, the question of what transpired at Judge Lamonde's home in 2008 does not matter. The investigation which followed was, in fact, seriously deficient and the closing order it produced was even worse. The design flaw of the investigation was that it was shrouded in absolute secrecy. Unlike the standard practice in civil law systems, defense counsel was excluded from the investigating judge's interviews completely. Defense teams were prohibited from, and even sanctioned for, conducting their own investigation, despite the ability of the co-prosecutors to do the same. For more than two years of the three years investigation, the co-investigating judges refused to provide basic information about the general direction and strategy of the investigation or the standard operating procedure, procedures of its investigators. Defense teams were in fact instructed to sit on their hands and wait as the co-investigating judges added documents and interviews to the case file in a manner which, from their blind vantage point, meant little in terms of a narrative of the history of democratic Kampuchea or of our client's role and responsibility. The moment basic information concerning OCIJ operating procedures came to light, it became apparent how far short they fell from the requirements of a fair and impartial investigation. Basic investigatory methods aiming to look beneath a witness surface claims were rarely, if ever, used. These include questions intended to probe the source, sources of witnesses' knowledge and the reliability of their 30-year-old recollections. Subsequent analysis has furthermore shown that investigators failed to employ safeguards, such as avoiding leading questions to ensure the reliability of the OCIJ statements. Numerous irregularities, such as off-the-record interviews and outright inaccuracies, also surfaced in those statements. Mr. President, the culmination of these flaws is in the closing order. Not surprisingly, the closing order does not read as a, as a judicial document rendering findings on a balance of probabilities. Instead, it is merely an argument in favor of Nguyen guilt. The word credibility does not appear once. Almost never does the closing order weigh conflicting evidence prior to articulating its conclusions. It repeatedly makes straightforward assertions of fact based on uncorroborated claims of a single witness who was in no position to make the claim in question. The co-investigating judges never conceived of their task as a judicial exercise. To them, it was an attempt to gather evidence to support a finding of guilt. Examples of this are abundant. One concerns the co-investigating judges' findings in relation to the alleged crimes at Tu Portre, the only crime site to ever be subject to serious adversarial analysis at the ECCC. As the defense has previously shown, nearly all of the co-investigating judges' most crucial findings were unsupported even on the face of the evidence cited in the footnotes. To reiterate just one example, 
Investigators were provided several estimates of the number of people allegedly killed at Du Portray, ranging from 200 up to 3,000. The co-investigating judges' own investigators described in their site identification report the killing of several hundreds, minimum 200, up to 1,000 or more, unquote. Yet the closing order states simply, witnesses' estimates as to the number of victims range from 2,000 up to approximately 3,000 corpses. Another concerns the co-investigating judge's constant reliance on Duke's testimony in support of uh, propositions for which he could not possibly have had any relevant contemporaneous knowledge. These include a variety of claims about events within the highly secretive standing committee and the personal interactions between the senior leaders of the CPK, almost none of whom he had ever met. Never did the investigating judges think to question whether Duick was an appropriate witness in relation to any of these claims. Until January 2013, when Judge Lamont publicly admitted that during his tenure at the ECCC, he had asked himself exactly that question. The closing order makes numerous other highly pre prejudicial conclusions on the, base, on the basis of a single clearly unreliable witness. Its allegation that our client decided on purchase within the military and belonged to a so-called purge planning committee is supported by a single ordinary soldier who, as Sung Si Kun explained to the investigating judges, knew nothing about the tasks of party leaders. The closing order cites the statement of Nguyen So Pang, a telegram decoder who knew nothing substantive about the work of the party center to conclude that standing committee meetings were called, and I quote, whenever there was an important matter requiring discussion, end of quote. The co-investigating judges never even considered whether there was reason to doubt the credibility of Ing Sari's claim that it was Nguyen Chia and not he who was responsible for a variety of tasks in democratic Kampuchea. The closing order fail, also fails to put forth exculpatory evidence that is directly inconsistent, inconsistent with the finding it purports to make. In one egregious example, the closing order cites to only three pieces of evidence supporting Nguyen Chia's alleged participation in a policy of targeting former officials and soldiers of the Khmer Republic. One of these is Heng Samrin's claim that Nguyen Chia indicated that former officials of the Khmer Republic should not be allowed to, and I quote, stay in the framework, unquote, of the new regime. Yet the closing order fails to consider his larger point, that Nguyen Chia wanted those officials to be removed rather than killed. The closing order similarly ignores the numerous statements of well-placed witnesses that the party center specifically instructed cadres not to harm Khmer Republic soldiers captured in battle. Two of these witnesses, Meyers Woon and P. Pon, are cited by the investigating judges a combined 120 time, 121 times in the closing order, almost exclusively for inculpatory purposes, ignoring they clearly exculpatory statements. The closing order wrongly concludes that Nguyen Chia is criminally responsible for, and therefore intended the commission of, widespread executions of former Lonol soldiers and officials. For a trial to be fair, the investigation on which it rests must also be balanced and impartial. With, this, with the investigation so critically compromised in the ways I have just described, our clients' fair trial rights hung in jeopardy even before the trial proceedings began. Mr. President, your honors, in light of these profound flaws in the judicial investigation, the final opportunity 
final opportunity to ensure the fairness of the proceedings lay with this trial chamber. Yet instead of remedying the prejudice caused by the investigation, it is our view that this chamber did exactly the opposite. The trial chamber's rulings were not only consistently unfair, unreasoned, Ill illogical, and based on no relevant applicable law, those rulings were also unfair specifically in ways which compounded and aggravated the prejudice caused by the judicial investigation. Like the co-investigating judges in the closing order and the co-prosecutors in their closing submissions, the trial chamber dramatically narrowed its focus and carefully herded this case towards its preconceived conclusion. And in our view, it did so in three general ways. By interfering with our efforts to present exculpatory evidence, by interfering with our efforts to challenge the prosecution's evidence, and by failing to take any steps to alleviate persistent government interference in the proceedings. And in so doing, the Chamber let lapse, let lapse any hope that the fairness of these proceedings could be salvaged. This Chamber's failures, Mr. President, to admit exculpatory evidence and explore exculpatory theories were repeated and manifest. The most serious example concerns its persistent refusal to call the most important witness in case 002-01, Heng Samrin. As we have argued repeatedly, he was the most important witness in relation to both the evacuation of Phnom Penh and the allegation at Tu Portray. And he was also our client's one and only character witness. With regard to Tu Portray, Heng Samrin is the only known witness in possession of direct evidence of our client's intent in regard to the treatment of Lon Nol soldiers and officials. As we will explain in greater detail later, he told Ben Keenan that our client specifically instructed cadres not to kill former Khmer Republic soldiers and officials. And as I have already noted, Heng Samrin is also the senior most military official living to have participated in the evacuation of Phnom Penh. His testimony would have been exculpatory in that regard as well. He would have confirmed that the Standing Committee had no effective control over the troops responsible for liberating and evacuating Phnom Penh, and that no orders to commit criminal acts were forthcoming from our client. Securing Heng Samrin's presence at trial was clearly a minimum requirement of our client's right to a fair trial. Yet this chamber denied or ignored no fewer than six successive requests for his appearance, including to appear as Nguyen Chia's only character witness. In the chamber, Mr. President, Your Honours, did not even attempt to secure his presence. As we demonstrate in detail in our brief, the chamber went so far as to prohibit us from discussing the chamber's decision not to summons him and to cut off our efforts to discuss his role in democratic Kampuchea. The Chamber's refusal to summons two other witnesses, Chia Sim and Uk Bun Chun, who perfectly possess first-hand knowledge of the intent of the party centers in relation to the treatment of former Korean Republic soldiers and officials, confirmed, in our view, that this Chamber was not interested in providing any opportunity to corroborate Heng Samrin's testimony. As with Heng Samrin, the Chamber prohibited so much as a discussion of the OCIJ summonses these men had blatantly ignored. The Chamber also disallowed any mention of the Chamber's refusal to place these witnesses on its witness list. All the while, the Chamber consented to the use of their statements for inculpatory purposes, revealing, and I'm sorry to say this in our view, its deeply ingrained bias in favor of the prosecution.
The chamber's, this chamber's refusal to summon witnesses crucial to the defense theory of the case was not limited to high-ranking government witnesses. Its denials extended to any witness in possession of exculpatory material pivotal to the defense theory of the case. As confirmation of this, one needs to look no further than the Chamber's persistent refusal to summons important context witnesses crucial to establishing a comprehensive narrative of the circumstances surrounding the Cambodian Socialist Revolution and essential to the substance of our client's defense. As we have attempted to explain time and again, it is impossible to assess CPK policy outside the context of how and why these policies were adopted. The co-investigating judges failed to give this issue any serious consideration, and this trial chamber proved even less responsive. This chamber repeatedly refused to hear oral submissions concerning the relevance of this testimony. This chamber ignored multiple written requests identifying nearly a dozen specific legal reasons why this evidence was relevant to our defense. Even after we narrowed the scope of our request to just four essential witnesses, this chamber refused to hear any of them. No reasons for any of these decisions have ever been forthcoming. Mr. President, the decision, your decision, not to hear any of these witnesses was a blatant abuse of New and Chia's right to a fair trial. Such testimony constituted the only opportunity, the only opportunity the defense had to investigate, let alone present evidence before the chamber in relation to a variety of crucial issues. These include for instance, the food and security situation in Phnom Penh and elsewhere in Cambodia in 1975, to the details of the American bombing campaign that ravaged the country, and three, most importantly, our clients' knowledge and intent in relation to the consequences of the evacuation. Unable, unable to call its own context-related witnesses, the defense was left no choice but to pick at the scraps of those called by the co-prosecutors and examine witnesses sought by them and chosen by the trial chamber. None of these witnesses were able to testify to the systemic factors which motivated and justified the CPK's conduct. Even under these circumstances, the chamber frequently prevented the, cha the defense from engaging in meaningful questioning in regards to the pre-75 conditions in Cambodia and the impact they had on events through democratic Kampuchea. The prejudicial effect of these rulings was amplified by the overall imbalance in the respective parties' on opportunities to call witnesses. At the close of evidence, the Chamber has had heard 75 substantive witnesses. Of these, 35 were selected by either the co-prosecutors or the civil parties without a parallel endorsement by the defense teams, while only four were selected by all the defense teams combined. This imbalance violated the equality of arms and created a fundamentally unfair environment in which Nguyen Chia's case was presented at a substantial disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis the co-prosecutors. Mr. President, this chamber has also consistently prevented us from exploring events following 1979, notwithstanding detailed submissions demonstrating the relevance of those events to questions at issue in case 002-01. These included the treatment and collection of documents by the PRK and Vietnam's role in writing the history of the CPK to suit its political agenda. Questions on these subjects during cross-examination were relevant and exculpatory in numerous ways. They concerned the legitimacy and independence of the tribunal, the authenticity of the evidence against our client, 
and the inherent bias against our client produced by the inculpatory narrative fostered by the PRK from the moment the CPK was ousted from power. These questions were consistently disallowed by the Chamber. Mr. President, this Chamber's blanket refusal to pursue evidence exculpatory as to Numa Chia culminated in its treatment of Rob Lemkin, the co-director and producer of the film Enemies of the People and One Day at Portray. Mr. Lemkin, whose film is in evidence and has been relied upon extensively by the co-prosecutors, informed us in an unsolicited email that the broader footage in his possession from which that film was cut established that the crimes allegedly committed at Hulpo Trey were not ordered by the party center. That footage also established that a military tribunal was held prior to the execution of the senior most officials of the Khmer Republic. Now, upon hearing this obviously exculpatory information, this chamber, Mr. President, decided its best course of action was to put its head in the sand and refused to make even one simple inquiry of Mr. Lemkin concerning the nature of that information. Even more prejudicial to our client's right to a fair trial was the maze of const constantly shifting procedural rules which improperly restricted our ability to meaningfully challenge the evidence admitted at trial. This chamber prohibited the use of documents to impeach witnesses, a practice universally accepted under Cambodian law, international practice, and at courts across the world. And as a consequence, our client was systematically prevented from confronting the witnesses against him. This chamber allowed witnesses and civil parties to review past recorded statements immediately before testifying. And as a consequence, the chamber made it impossible for defense counsel to identify inconsistencies in the memories of witnesses testifying to 35-year-old events. This chamber admitted well over 1,000 out-of-court witness statements without the appearance of the witness for cross-examination. As we will discuss later in connection with Tool Portray, a small handful of those statements are now, are now rel relied upon by the co-prosecutors for, for the purpose of establishing the existence of a CPK policy of executing law null soldiers and officials. Witnesses whom neither the public nor this chamber have ever seen. And as the international co-prosecutor recently said, that justice should not only be done, but also be seen to be done. Yet these witnesses, whom the co-prosecutors now say, after six years, are crucial to this case, have never been seen by anybody. That this chamber approved the blanket admissions also of thousands of documents obtained by DC Chem without any serious investigation of their chain of custody prior to the DC Chem, DC Chem founding in 1995. As a consequence, the chamber based nearly this entire trial on documents whose authenticity was never adequately established. The chamber did not even accede to our request that DC Chem provide information as to the chain of custody of the documents in its possession. And in so doing, the chamber displayed its complete disinterest in assessing the authenticity of the documents admitted against our client. In all of these respects, it seems that, Mr. President, this chamber chose expedience over rigor. It chose deliberately not to subject the allegations against Nguyen Chia to the kind of scrutiny which, from the perspective of defense counsel, is the point of a trial to begin with. Another serious restriction on our client's ability to challenge the evidence against him was in the near absolute prohibition on questioning which concerned the judicial investigation. I have already demonstrated the ways in which the investigation of case 002 was plagued by errors and oversights. When we complained about these problems during the investigation, we were told 
by both the co-investigating judges and the pretrial chambers, chamber that any flaws in the method of the investigation could be remedied through cross-examination at trial. Yet when we sought to hear witnesses at trial to challenge their inculpatory statements on record, our requests were routinely dismissed. When witnesses did appear and we tried to explore the flaws in their statements given to the investigating judges, we were informed by the chamber without a hint of irony that we should have raised those issues during the investigation. Judge Lavergne demanded to know, and I quote, what have the defense lawyers been doing over the course of the many years of the judicial investigation, unquote. Mr. President, the answer, of course, is that we were filing well over a dozen motions demanding that these flaws be remedied without ever receiving any substantive or timely relief. A wide variety of relevant and probative questions about the investigations were constantly disallowed by the Chamber. These included, for, instance, for example, whether witnesses had been fed information, coached or shown documents, coerced, intimidated or influenced, misunderstood or misquoted, or interviewed multiple times without audio record records being prepared. In one of many extraordinary examples, this chamber refused our attempts to cross-examine a witness as to whether OCIJ investigators had said anything off the record during his interview, despite the rev revelation that investigators had done just that with another witness living in the same town who was a DK era colleague of the witness before the chamber and who had been interviewed by the investigating judges 20 minutes prior to the witness being cross-examined. In another example, questions regarding an incident in which a witness who was heard to ask OCIJ investigators whether he could look at his notes before responding to a question were disallowed. Mr. President, in this regard, we were frustrated at every turn. Yet, the most egregious rulings with regard to examinations concerning the investigation came with the testimony of Stephen Hedder. For reasons that everyone in this courtroom knows well, Mr. Hedder was a truly exceptional witness. In 2004, Mr. Hedder published seven candidates for prosecution, a book advocating for the prosecution of seven specific defendants, including our client, Nguyen Chia. When this tribunal was established for that purpose, Mr. Hedder was immediately hired by the Office of the Co-Prosecutors to help write the introductory submissions. After the introductory submissions were filed, Stephen Hedder was retained by the investigating judges for the purpose of investigating the allegations he himself had made, first in seven candidates and then in the introductory submissions. He then helped write the closing order in which we were not surprised to discover he agreed with his own allegations. When those allegations came to trial before this chamber, Mr. Heather was summoned as a witness. He gave evidence about the allegations he had laid out in seven candidates, formally lodged on behalf of the co-prosecutors, investigated on behalf of the OCIJ, and then confirmed in the closing order. Coming full circle, the co-prosecutors now rely on Mr. Hedder's evidence extensively in support of the allegations made on their behalf, on their behalf six years ago. Now, Mr. President, no one doubts Mr. Hedder's credentials as an academic and a researcher. Yet, as a participant in this process and a witness before this chamber, there are serious questions in need of answers. Any court truly concerned with the reliability of the evidence before it would demand clear and detailed explanations concerning the nature and extent of Mr. Hedder's role in the introductory submissions and the judicial investigation that followed. In light of Mr. Hedder's extraordinary influence over these proceedings, any, co any court concerned with ascertaining the truth 
would be especially motivated to probe the foundations of his conclusions. President, the time is now appropriate for a short break, Council. So we will take a 20 minute break and I return at 11 a.m. Some ground show.